Calimera to all the urbanists out there. Once you start leaving the center of Athens, you also start seeing very interesting architecture, definitely from the 1900s here in the neighborhoods of Bagrati and Kulunaki. Today we're going to explore this side of Athens that most people usually don't explore if they're sticking to the main sites. And today I'm joined by Evan of Explorabilia, who will be hosting urbanist tours we're collaborating together. It'll be taking you on in real life versions of these urbanist videos that you can join along because he is one of the best urbanists I know in person. We collaborate all the way back in 2018, January in London, and we've collaborated many times since. So today you're going to get a taste of what you could do in person starting around spring of 2024. So Hi. Evan, uh, do let me know briefly about you and then let us know where we're located. Fantastic. And this is Evan from Explorabilia. I uh, do walking tours in London and elsewhere. I lead international tours uh, in Poland, in Greece, France and Finland. And I'm here with uh, Ariel to show you this part of Athens. That's amazing. And then where we're located? Where, uh, you said Pagrati is that way. So we have Pagrati that way. And this is where Kolonaki is and Likabetus Hill, which we can see there at the top of the street. And uh, this is uh, Avenue Basilis Solvas, uh, Basilis Sophias, excuse me, uh, at the Queen Sophia Avenue. Shall we cross? Yeah, we shall. Yeah. We're getting the red. Yeah. All right, we gotta go fast. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, so this is very interesting. This is really old. Can you tell? It, it does look old. Yeah, yeah. The branches are so thick. Yeah. And this is an olive tree. It is an olive tree. It's uh, extremely old. I don't know if, uh, you know, perhaps we shouldn't oh. show this. <laughs> we shouldn't spill the beans. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so uh, guess how old this is. What do you think? Yeah. How old this tree is? Do you think it's, this is several decades old or uh, several centuries old, perhaps? Why don't you venture a guess while we walk? And we're going to reveal the answer towards the end of the walk. <laughs> Maybe we have to try one of the olives to see. <laughs> <laughs> Are they soggy olives or are they nice and ripe olives? Yeah, well, you know, they are, they are in season, but there are not many olives in, in that tree because obviously it hasn't been pruned perhaps for, mm. for decades even. So I don't think it makes any good olives anymore. Yeah. <laughs> wow, Kay's already guessing 800 years old. Huh, let's see. We'll reveal it a little bit sooner. Let's reveal in about 10 minutes because... Sure. <laughs> People are going to continue guessing. So let us know how old do you think this particular olive tree is right over here. And then what's the sculpture over here that we see? Uh, this sculpture is called the Runner. Mm. It's uh, by a of the modern city of Athens. Everybody's rushing to go to places here and there. And the Runner, therefore, has become a symbol, let's say, of Athens, a metaphorical symbol for a city that never sleeps and it's always kind of rushing somewhere. Forward, of course, always forward. It's true, yeah, and uh, I think a lot of the, the, these ho major hotels were for the Olympics, right? Or they probably were packed during the mm. previous Olympics. Absolutely, yeah. yes, but uh, this is not any uh, major hotel. Perhaps uh, what we see here yeah. is the first major hotel, major luxury hotel that was built in Greece. This is uh, Hilton Athens. Uh, it opened, I believe, in the end of the 50s, in 1958, and perhaps it was the first modern hotel of its size, modern five-star hotel, that was opened in Athens. It has uh, over 900 rooms, and the Let's Conrad, move down here because uh, it's uh, going to be noisy, noisy with all the uh, yeah. with the fountain. Sure. But you were saying it has uh, over 900 rooms and. Uh, uh, Hilton's uh, chain's uh, founder, Conrad Hilton, was here in person to inaugurate it. Oh, really? And, and he was good friends with Onassis, so that's very interesting. They were very good friends, of yeah. course, and of course, over the years, you have Onassis partying there, Frank Sinatra, and all these kind of big celebrities of the 60s and the 70s have stayed there. I mean, too many to mention now. But uh, Conrad Hilton was uh, here. The urban legend has it that at that point in time, he mentioned that this is the most beautiful, most beautiful hotels here on worldwide <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen that's why i'm collaborating with evan uh, to do urban style tours because 
he also talks about the urban legends, which is not common with all tour guides. Yeah, <laughs> it was built by yeah. this uh, gentleman you might be able to see it over there yeah. uh, in that photo. His name was Emmanuel Burekas. Uh, uh, we will see that he built another. He was involved in another building down the road. Mm. Yeah. And it's uh, currently um, not occupied. At the moment, no. It's uh, undergoing a major renovation. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge landmark for Athens, and uh, obviously we're looking after it very well. Uh, so it's undergoing a major renovation. It's going to reopen as a Conrad brand. Uh, so it's going to be even more luxurious uh, than it used to be. Yeah. It is, of course, built in the modernist style, which was uh, a new thing for Athens uh, in, in the 50s. And, of course, from that point onwards, we have, you know, the you know, advance of modernism in the architecture of Athens going forward in the post-war period. Right, you see plenty of modernism yeah. all around Athens. Sure, shall we cross or shall we go the opposite way? Uh, let's go that side okay. because it will be easier to walk along the side, the other side walk. Yeah. Uh, Francis, uh, pregunta, ¿cuál es el título de la escultura? La escultura se llama co uh, Corridor, yo creo que se traduce en español. Uh, the name of the sculpture is called Runner. Uh, CB, nice to see you here. Hello, Brett. Hello, Kay. Hello, Gwen. Let us know where you're watching from. Right now, I'm with Evan Panagopoulos. That's right. Yes, got it right. Uh, of Explorabilia. And who's good at Frogger? Let us know. What's the best tactic for getting across traffic? Just wait for the red lines. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ofofuto says, look at the olive tree. Yes. All right, let us know your guesses. We already talk talked about this olive tree in the beginning. Hello, Paige from North Carolina. Nice to see you here. Hello, CB. CB says hello to Evan. Hi. Right, here's a chance. I think we're getting, uh, we're getting there. We got it. We got it. Go, 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 go. Don't slow down. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> of all the times, Greeks drive fast, she drives slow. <laughs> uh, go read what it says, Ofofutos. Evan knows it by heart. So I think it's time to reveal how old it is. Well, that's 800 years old. Someone asked, uh, said a few decades old. Guys, it's 15 centuries old. Oh, my God. <laughs> 1,500 years, and it's a tree that has not been native there, but it has been transplanted from the Peloponnese because yeah. they needed to do some work on the old railway line there, so they took it out, they planted it here. It's one of the oldest trees they found in the region, so it was worth saving. Wow! 15th century is crazy. Yeah. And then here, this is an interesting sure. building. Wow. Yeah. Very beautiful. Kind of Art Nouveau, Art Deco. I should say at Nouveau, yeah, Nouveau, what with yeah. Eric Harris and these figures, figureheads next to the door, I would say, you know, early 20th century, very early, maybe the first three decades. Yeah, gorgeous. So we're walking through the more luxurious neighborhood of center Athens. Yeah. Yeah. More Kolonaki. Yeah, we have Kolonaki yeah. on our left. And we have Pagrati, which is a more, much more populated area on, mm. the, on the right. And you have to imagine that some, perhaps they had one of the grandest buildings in Athens at that time, uh, in the late 50s. And therefore, uh, many made comparisons between this and the Parthenon. <laughs> because visually, if you saw those uh, two buildings from a distance, you could make visual comparisons. You know, white, somewhat rectangular building, kind of uh, very historic on top of a hill, which is, of course, the Parthenon and Acropolis. And then you have the new panel, monumental scale building of Hilton. And some people said that this uh, visual kind of comparison that Athenians were subjected to at the time was even uh, unethical, inappropriate. That, uh, you know, anyone thought about building something that is grander, uh, you know, and visually similar to Parthenon. Uh, but people have uh, gotten used to it and they love it uh, very much as a landmark, so much so that this entire area is called Hilton. Uh, so if you live somewhere between Kolonaki and Pagrati, you can easily say that I live in Hilton. Oh, I was to say, picked up the name, that's fascinating. Yeah. 
I mean, the, the Policatequias here look a little bit nicer, a little bit more um, modernist style. Or Art Deco, Art Nouveau. Absolutely, Some yes. Some Bauhaus. Beautiful tree line streets, and you can see the upward slope because we're heading towards Licavetus Hill here. So, Licavetus, tallest mountain center, Athens. Yeah. yeah. And Eugene says, Good morning, Ariel and friend. I'm with Evan of Explorabilia. Tom Tom is from Venice, Florida. Let's see you here. Hi, Eugene. Yeah. We can see, of course, the, the influence of modernism and uh, if we think, uh, if we go back to 1933, one of the most uh, monumental and defining events in the history of modernist architecture took place here in Athens. Mm. So you have the Fourth International Congress of Modernism, a, uh, let's say a cabal almost of architects, modernist architects of the early 20th century, uh, figures like uh, the, the great Le Corbusier, Edouard Zanaret, uh, Marcel Breuer, uh, Walter Gropius, uh, director of uh, Bauhaus, uh, Laszlo Moholy Nike, and many others, uh, got on a steamer in uh, Marseille, a steamship, sailed the Mediterranean, working, exchanging ideas, brainstorming about modernism and urban regeneration, and ended up here in Athens, oh, where wow. they, uh, and the works of this Congress, 10 years later, were issued as a book, as a charter, let's say, as a dogma for the modernist architecture describing the functional city, as Le Corbusier described it. Uh, the new cities that uh, would be, uh, uh, let's say, defined by zoning, residential zones, entertainment zones, business zones, transportation links, uh, and the Charter of Athens ever since is known to have influenced post-war modern architecture, and it all happened here. And of course, it did have its impact in this city, and the architects both Architects, you know, previous established architects, but the new generation of architects that came after them were influenced by this. What I love about Athens is the, all the mixed use in all these buildings. Uh, as you mentioned, the, the zoning is not as super strict as it is in parts of the U.S. or other parts of Europe. Look at these buildings. Let me uh, zoom in on. They look nice. It's uh, to me, it's a little bit like a Paris feel here in this area. Someone has a huge penthouse up there. All right, lead the way. Sure. Let's cross here. Hello Eugene, nice to see you here. Welcome everyone, love where you're watching from. Slam that like button right now if you're enjoying these broadcasts and want to see more of them. So this is uh, Vasilisi Sofia, the Queen Sofia Avenue, one of the busiest uh, avenues in Athens. Uh, you know, you never see it uh, empty of cars, even in the early hours of the morning, someone always is going to make their way to the center up. Uh, it ends up in Syntagma and the parliaments. Mm. Uh, also, this is the main artery of, of Athens. It right is, here. very much. And it splits uh, into the Constantine the first. Uh, uh, you know, King Constantine the first. Uh, um, it's connected by the metro avenue as well. And we have the metro station, uh, the metro station here, which is Megaro Musikis, the mm. musical. Which we're going to see it just uh, just beyond the trees ahead of us. Again, uh, built by Emmanuel Burekas, uh, the same architect who led uh, the construction of Hilton in the 50s. Uh, one of uh, perhaps his most well-known projects after that was this uh, music hall uh, between 1976 and 1991 when it opened. This is one of the also few places I've seen parks as well. In the in Athens. Not too many parks in, in the city. It's lovely, isn't it? And all these green spaces, uh, if I'm not mistaken, belong to the landscaping of the Megaro ah, that's of the musical. <clears throat> so, you know, they, they belong to the lands uh, that was uh, set aside to build the musical and therefore, you know, the landscaping uh, complements the, uh, the musical in many ways. And, and you are right, one of the 
perhaps very kind of uh, rare, <laughs> expansive uh, green, uh, green spaces uh, we see in central Athens. And even then, it's still pretty empty. Almost no one comes to the few parks that are in Athens. Perhaps they don't know it exists. <laughs> or yeah, they don't, or they don't believe it. <laughs> you see, someone uh, flew a kite uh, on that olive tree, you know, on, uh, on Ash Monday. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know that we have this, uh, uh, this custom, flying kites. Monday after Carnival is like Ash Monday. Oh, interesting. So yeah, you make your own kites, as you can see, with those uh, kind of sticks and uh, string and uh, it's kind of uh, special paper. Uh, and then you fly it in an open space. But people who live in central Athens, I suppose, this is the only space they have to fly a kite. <laughs> and someone, uh, someone crashed it on that tree. But uh, you know, it's a nice, uh, it's a nice castle, very nice castle. Every kid creates their own kites and flying them. Right. Even even here in central Athens. Uh, hello, Mika. Nice to see you here. Uh, Fafuto says, in the decades 50s and 70s, there was a lot of inspiration from French architecture. Yeah, as you mentioned, Le Cabousier. Mm -hmm. um, Gideon says, hey man, I sent you a message about getting a work visa here in Greece, but you never responded. Gideon, I got all the visas. Every visa you ever wanted. <laughs> <laughs> I got passports, visa. No, I'm joking. <laughs> For that, this is the wrong place. I don't think it's, uh, is it very difficult to get a work permit for someone? I, I suppose they're from the USA, but I think it's possible. No, I, this person's not from the USA. Uh, I think they're from <laughs> Southeast Asia. Uh -huh. uh, but yeah, <laughs> I think, I think it's, it's a bit tricky. There is a process and maybe you'll become acquainted with the Greek bureaucracy as well, <laughs> which uh, I don't wish it upon anyone. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if you need any help, uh, you know, just kind of pop a message to Ariel and uh, see. <laughs> of course, yeah, we can point you to the right direction <laughs> right, at because least. I know all of them. <laughs> I, I, I'm poking fun of this comment. Um, it's a bit of an inside joke because uh, as a content creator, especially if you're doing travel content, I get bombarded with these messages for a weird reason. I have no idea why. <laughs> but here we have... Wow, this is a gorgeous music hall. The music hall, yes. As you were just mentioning before. Yeah. Also, very reminiscent of Lincoln Center in New York City. Mm hmm Yeah. Sue from Yorkshire. Nice to see you here. It's very modern with a world-class auditorium and uh, clad in marble, as many buildings in Greece are. Let's uh, take a closer uh, look. Fufuto says this is the closest thing to an opera. So, is there an opera house? Yes, there is. There is, a, a, there is an opera house inside. There is a kind of a, a theater with marvelous uh, uh, and a music hall with marvelous acoustics and various other kind of smaller spaces. Even a conference hall. Yeah. And is there an official more uh, opera house in Athens? Yes. Like its own its own thing. We yeah we don't have what you might expect uh, to see like in. Uh, Paris, like the, Real Marvel, yeah. the Opera Garnier or the Phoenix uh, in Venice, uh, the Fenice, but uh, it's a much more modern space where uh, such kind of opera can be performed. Yeah. No, Fufuto Siesa says, uh, yeah, unfortunately there's no opera house here. Mika says, wow, yeah, it's very, it's very interesting. It looks just like uh, the Metropolitan Opera in New York City. Yeah. Uh, very similar shape to it. That's cool. So I think um, it is interesting to walk outside the center here in Athens. Um, the distances are not that long, and you end up seeing interesting buildings like these. Yeah. <clears throat> this is a tiny, very old hospital, Alexandra mm -hmm. uh, Hospital, uh, which is the only one so close, perhaps, to this and Evangelismos over there. They are the key ones uh, for this kind of part of Athens. They're quite, uh, they're quite small. Uh, Emily, Emily, who's a, a Swede based in Thessaloniki, says the Greek bureaucracy is a whole nother level of experience. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Emily, I mean, uh, you know, you've been in Thessaloniki and you, obviously you've been around to kind of try to get things done and uh, you've wasted possibly as much time as any Greek by now, <laughs> uh, you know, from uh, you know, previous time from your life, trying to get this document stamped and this other one approved. And, you know, it's just a, 
just a losing struggle. But in, in <laughs> recent years, uh, things have got better. You can do a lot of things online these days. Oh, good. Uh, in the last five years or so. Uh, and things are, trust me, are much easier than they used to be, at least for simple day-to-day -day transactions with this day. So yes. for context, uh, Evan is uh, from the area of Kipadesia originally, close to it, in the Peloponnese. If you want to learn more about Evan's home area, check out the vlog that I did with him in the Peloponnese. Yeah. <laughs> so we're heading on towards now uh, it's kind of beautiful, perhaps uh, for me the most beautiful modernist building in Athens. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Walter uh, uh, Gropius' American U.S. Embassy uh, okay. from uh, 1958. Uh, they may or may not uh, tell us off for taking videos of the I embassy. I think uh, we'll talk about it in that other corner. Yeah, let's I'll go zoom to the in other a corner. Bit that way and, uh, yes. Yeah, because embassies usually don't like uh, filming. No, it's very, very, very high security as, as it should be. Not least because it has suffered not one, but two rocket attacks over the years. Okay, <laughs> well then, yes, we will film on the other side. <laughs> one in the 90s. Yeah. Say, uh, are you shooting? I am, yeah. Yeah, Still, yeah. yeah. so in uh, an anti-tank missile from one of those kind of uh, polygatikias, just yeah. across, uh, kind of on, the, on this kind of wall that existed here. And later on, I think it was 2004 or 2006, another, you know, rocket propelled grenade that crashed, uh, you know, the, the way it went through the windows and uh, uh, thankfully inside the toilet and it was really early in the morning and no one was there and it kind of exploded there. <laughs> uh, well, what, did they ever find the assailants? The, yeah, yeah, I think they were kind of uh, one of those uh, kind of leftist, uh, leftist anarchist groups that uh, had uh, kind of some cheese with uh, imperialism and the NATO and, and whatever. And of course, we have a minority. Uh, of those here in Greece as well, and some of them were more militant in the 90s. Uh, and unfortunately, they kind of expressed this militancy by attacking the US Embassy. But it's something that uh, doesn't happen anymore. Oh, good, good. Because, wow. uh, they've all been arrested and they're serving long terms in prison. So. They had to have a very powerful launcher uh, to do it from this distance. Yeah. Here from this point of the gear. Yeah. It wasn't very powerful, no, thankfully. It was one of those rocket propelled things. Oh, okay. Uh, and therefore it didn't do... No, it's, it didn't even do a... You know, it did a dance, but uh, nothing else. Stay tuned, everyone. We will, once we cross the street, we'll show you more of the building. Yeah, it's not advisable to... Uh, oh, I got, I, got, I got told off by security in France for shooting the British Embassy. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we have to stand at a distance to admire uh, Walter Gropius' uh, genius. In building this building is very, uh, you know, very Bauhaus style. Of course, Gropius was the director of Bauhaus until 1933, and uh, then he was in the UK for a few years, and then he moved to America, where he uh, uh, he led a school of architecture at the, uh, the MIT, if I'm mm. not wrong. Uh, and uh, during his tenure there, this is when he was invited here to build this. Interesting. The US Embassy, perhaps the most wonderful, uh, well-appointed uh, modernist building in Athens. What do you appreciate about it? I think it uh, combines everything that is uh, celebrated about uh, the international modernist style, the Bauhaus style. Mm. I mean, it has the, uh, uh, you know, has, has the window facades to allow maximum amount of light inside the building. Uh, the building is standing on, on stilts, on pillow key, enabling kind of access underneath uh, vehicle and, and, and human traffic. Uh, it has like a, this kind of open plan. Uh, I expect so anyway, inside, because uh, you can see that the entire building is supported by this pillow key and therefore it doesn't require uh, load-bearing walls, etc. Uh, so you can have any kind of size of a room or space in, kind of divided by, by just drywall. Oh, fascinating. Oh, and interesting. So, yeah, they could have designed, they could, they can rearrange anything that they want inside. Yeah. And of course, you have, uh, you know, the flat roof. Uh, it's very much a kind of celebrated feature of yeah. modernist uh, architecture because, uh, you know, modernist architects they didn't kind of get, you know, what we need, kind of those gable roofs. Um, and especially Breuer, uh, sorry, especially Gropius, who had, uh, you know, this experience as a director of Bauhaus in Dessau in the 1930s and the rise of the Nazis uh, who 
marched into Bauhaus in the 30s demanding that uh, you know they just go away uh, from there because they were very kind of forward thinking and many of them were kind of socialists and communists and they just didn't like them to be in Dessau. So they marched them out of Dessau upon the threat that they're going to build a gabled roof on top of the Bauhaus, which was of course a very modernist building with a very flat roof. So that was the threat. They eventually managed, unfortunately, to, to kick them out. But that's of course for the benefit of everyone else, uh, because many of them moved to, to England, they moved to, to America, and they planted the seed of, of Bauhaus aesthetics and modernism uh, in, in those countries. But the rest is history. We see you know, the results here. It's a trial, I guess, I guess against uh, this kind of totalitarian, I mean, totalitarian, uh, very kind of conservative uh, approach towards architecture. Right. Yeah. Oh, cool. And that's what I like about the US Embassy in particular, but uh, every modernist building, every modernist post-war building uh, gives me this air of kind of a new, something better. Tony says it looks very well fortified. You can see how it does, yeah. <laughs> it probably is, and in ways that we cannot even uh, we can't even imagine. I mean, I, I, I've been told, or at least people assume that, uh, especially after those rocket attacks, many of those buildings around here and many of those flats are not owned by anyone other than either the, the Greek state or the embassy. Uh, so nobody can get ideas anymore. Nobody can get access, easy access to those places. Right. And there is, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of security. There's plenty of cameras which is like cameras in Greece are not a thing. I don't know, in, in the US and the UK, perhaps in every corner, traffic cameras, speed cameras everywhere. But here in Greece, it's not allowed. Uh, really, is that? Police cameras per se. Oh, no, it's unconstitutional. It's Greeks, they don't want to be, you know, monitored. <laughs> yeah, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. So to speak. But over here, you see that there's, uh, there's plenty of cameras in this corner. And uh, perhaps, I mean, even this uh, building is also, sorry to interrupt, but it also looks yeah, very unique to look it's all tinted <laughs> windows and cameras and, uh, you know, all the accesses. And of course, there is this, uh, uh, these roads around it, they're obstructed for, for vehicle traffic, etc. Mm -hmm. So it's all very uh, organic. You know, we don't notice all that until, you know, someone points it at us. So yeah, it's very as safe and secure as it can be. Uh, but this is not the only embassy here, of course. We just uh, went past the Argentinian embassy. We have a, what is this, a Maltese. Maltese, interesting. <laughs> Maltese embassy there. Uh, uh, Susie says so much traffic. Yeah, this is in essence a highway in the middle of the city. Oh, oh uh, this is, yeah. this, this is nothing now. People are still on holiday. I, uh, oh, wow, okay. You know, <laughs> traffic is when uh, it's full of cars, but nothing is moving. Oh, wow. This is like, uh, I mean, we're up there with uh, Calcutta and Cairo in that respect, yeah, mm. on busy days. And um, Christoph says, Bauhaus is interesting to visit in Dessau, a day trip from Berlin. Dessau. Yes. And Rhonda, hi, nice to see you here, Rhonda. Hope you're doing well. Susie almost slept through this because it's like 5 a.m. in New York City or something like that. Uh, Rhonda, nice to see you here. Welcome. And hello, everyone. If you have any questions for Evan, feel free to ask. Evan is a professional tour guide, has been doing this for a few years, going through various countries. Evan's from Greece. And, um, and he will be hosting urbanist style tours starting in 2024. So stay tuned for more news on that. And then later on, we're going to discuss a little bit more about the tours as we find ourselves a good coffee. Wow, another great building. And this one's really covered with vines. Oh, wow. Do you find that tourists come here or is this something that's a little bit off the beaten path for tourism? I think it's totally off the beaten path because yeah. there's nothing touristy here. Most tourists uh, would stop at uh, Likabetus perhaps, they go up and head back to old central Athens. Uh, and over here it's mostly embassies, offices, uh, residential, this sort of thing. There's no, uh, you know, there, there's no kind of uh, normal highlights, so to speak, but for me, uh, these these modern, modernist buildings that we just saw are, are part of the highlands and, and should be seen, especially for those who are enthusiastic about this style of architecture. Exactly, yeah. It's interesting because in, um, in Washington, D.C., in the U.S., 
Embassy Row is very popular. <laughs> it's a, it is a tourist attraction. But there's not that many embassy areas in, in the world where people actually gravitate to. Yeah. Despite the architecture, it is interesting. This is Serbia. Serbia right here, oh, interesting. Yeah. And the, there's these uh, security boxes, huh? Interesting. Oh, yeah. They, kept, they keep close eye. Yeah. You can't see if there's anyone actually in there, but you can't there tell. Might be. Yeah. You cannot tell, yeah. <laughs> there may or may not be. There might if, be a holiday. Or if they're awake or not. Having a cafe somewhere, <laughs> but you don't know that. <laughs> Only they do. <laughs> it's very smart, actually. Very smart. Yeah. LAB, nice to see you here. And are, are any of these areas changing or is it more um, the areas closer to the center that are changing more rapidly? I think uh, central Athens, the area around the Sindama and Ammonia is changing more rapidly. Okay. Uh, changing more rapidly because uh, those areas have been uh, dilapidated in recent decades, especially in the aftermath of the uh, financial crisis from 2008 onwards and then we had in 2000. Uh, uh, 11 and 13 again and you know everyone saw that on TV and as a result uh, many of those businesses and small shops and uh, even residents in, in central Athens uh, were driven away from the crisis but now it's all coming back uh, it's all all has recovered and uh, in the last uh, three or four years the, especially the area around St. Dagmar Square uh, has become uh, inundated with lovely small businesses, cafes and fashion stores and uh, 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 local arts and crafts and uh, really some really great gelato and coffee also, <laughs> I have to say. Oh, that's right. Uh, and uh, it's become very lively and vibrant and it expanded this traditional tourist, uh, in brackets, area of Plaka, which is very beautiful in its own right. Mm. But now this area has expanded towards Syntagma and it's a much kind of larger area someone can wander um, and find many many interesting things to see do. let me zoom in on here this is very interesting what yeah. building is this <clears throat> yet another hospital Hippocrat well this is hospital as well huh? yeah this is some of the oldest hospital in Athens it's uh, not just embassy row it's also yeah. hospital row now that I'm thinking about it and yeah. named after Hippocrato which uh, is the Hippocratic oath I guess so in, uh, that doctors take. That's it, yeah, that's Hippocrates with the Hippocratic oath, and uh, it's the Hippocratic hospital, it's his hospital, and it looks like something. I don't think I'm wrong, but this is like something uh, from the time of uh, Otto or thereabouts. Yeah, yeah, it's, I can it's an old, old building. It, it should be contemporary to the university, the library, and those buildings. Uh, because they, why, they want to emulate ancient Athens. Yes. It's a kind of neoclassical revival architecture, which is, uh, it's stunning. I mean, I like modernism, but it's beautiful. And one of the few skyscrapers. Yeah, this yeah. is very, again, very modernism. Uh, like something uh, uh, that might have been designed by Mies van der Rohe in Chicago. Uh, oh, yeah, that's Beatles. right. And also in, in New York. And in New York as yeah. well, yeah. It reminds me of his buildings. Uh, I do not recall who has built this. Uh, it's not me, yes, unfortunately. Uh, but fortunately, uh, I think it's someone, uh, a local architect, that has uh, applied this international modernist style. It's a beautiful, uh, it's a beautiful high-rise. It's the this is where Inter American, the insurance uh, company, is housed. So it's called the Inter American Tower. And hey, Madeline, nice to see you here. Welcome. where we're going so we're gonna head through there okay cool I'm surprised they don't build underpasses or overpasses here <laughs> like they do in London Can, uh, Is there a crosswalk? Let's cross. Let's cross at the traffic light. Yeah. Yeah. Will there be more skyscrapers in the near future? Asked Susie. 
Well, and, and the Nikko will be, which is outside of Athens city proper. Yeah. But it's in the metropolitan area, closer to Glipada. This is, uh, this is going to be pretty big, yes. The El Nikko airport, before we created this new airport, the Ferios Venizelos, uh, in, uh, ahead of the 2004 Olympics, mm. we had an airport very close to the sea, the Athenian Riviera, the El Nikko airport, named after the area it's in. This was built by, by Onassis. Oh, uh, so uh, Onassis funded it and he kind of gifted it to, uh, to the States. And uh, there is a connection between its terminal and the TWA terminal in uh, New York. Why is that? Same architect. Saarinen. Saarinen built the terminal of the old Elinico airport. And are the, they preserving it? They are preserving it, thankfully, wow. uh, because of course it has remained vacant since 2004 and it was very dilapidated and derelict. I, uh, <coughs> I visited it a number of times in that site. It was really sad because it was such a beautiful classic terminal of the 50s and the 60s, kind of marble everywhere and those kind of nice deep laden seats and the big kind of notice boards and everything. It was like a you know, blast from the past. Uh, so they were going to preserve at least the main terminal, which is an interesting building by Saarinen, not as elaborate as the PWA terminal, but... Uh, and then uh, they're going to create one of the highest skyscrapers, uh, perhaps going to be the highest in Athens, and one of the most interesting new development projects in Europe at the moment, in terms of scale and cost. There's a crosswalk down there? Yeah. yeah. Alright, let's go somewhere quieter as well. Traffic here is crazy. It's gonna be it's gonna be a bit quieter now because yeah. we're walking towards uh, one of Greece's oldest football stadiums. Oh very cool. And we're talking about football like the European type of football. <laughs> uh, With yeah. your feet, not not handball. Yeah, not handball and not wearing this kind of uh, suits of arm or <laughs> like uh, you know bubble wrapping players for for what reason uh, no get... though another american sport is popular here in greece uh basketball oh very yeah. very much so yes and i think for many uh for many greeks i believe it's uh you know the primary the most popular sport rather than football makarios of cyprus popular historic figure Divisive, uh, but popular uh, among Greeks. Divisive. Uh, How so? Well, he uh, he had something to do with uh, you know events that led to the uh, invasion of uh, Cyprus and its eventual split between northern and southern. Oh. He was a head of state uh, in Cyprus at the time. Oh, wow, a clergy yeah. member was a head of state. A clergy member was a head of state. Yes. Well, that that, was, that's uh, why it's divisive. That was already yeah. quite. Uh, yeah, quite. I suppose that uh, at least one of the communities might not have taken that lightly. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, but he is uh, he is Makarios, yes. Yeah, because the Greek Orthodoxy. Let's go on this crosswalk now. Yeah. Over here. <laughs> now I now I know why locals. Oh, let's wait. Let's wait. I'm not gonna take the risk. Now I know why locals say uh, walking in Athens is, is crazy. Walking with Jay. <laughs> hey Jay, nice to see you here. <laughs> Dark Shadow, welcome. <laughs> oh my God. What, <laughs> I think that's What's up the, with the sidewalk? <laughs> that's one of the tiniest sidewalks in Athens right here, as you can see. This is insane. Um, yeah. This is why, unfortunately, Athens is a great city to visit, in my opinion. But um, let me continue after we pass this police station. Athens is a great city to visit. However, I don't recommend it for people who have mobility issues or uh, need accessibility because it does become tough. It does become very tough.
Evan actually has a, per, a perspective of a tour guide. I know you don't specialize in this, but you might have pro tips for people who do have mobility issues and the accessibility. Are there ways that they can visit Athens? Uh, or in Greece in general? Do, do you know of tours that specialize in that or? Of course there yeah. are ways. There, there are ways. ways to get from A to B. Uh, public transport, for example, in Athens is quite accessible. There are lifts uh, and escalators everywhere uh, that can be used to go from platform to platform. And, uh, and the tube stations themselves, you may have noticed, they're much wider and more open than uh, many other parts of the world. I mean, uh, especially comparing this to London, which has a very aging and old uh, uh, station network. and. Uh, the platforms of the Athens Metro are, are superior because, of course, they are more modern as well. And they were built to accommodate uh, uh, that. Then uh, access to the Acropolis and the Acropolis Museum also is very good. Okay. Which I guess it's something that every every visitor in Athens would like to enjoy. Oh, because they recently installed elevators for accessibility. They have the installed the elevators, yes, yeah. and now it's much easier for anyone. Uh, of any age and every kind of capability to, to go up there and visit. Oh. Uh, just to roam aimlessly around Athens. Uh, I think it's a little bit more difficult because you don't know what's the state of the sidewalk or the pavement in any given. Exactly. I mean, you can turn a corner, it might be completely blocked by trees and... Cars parked. Public lights, cars parked on the pavements, uh, tables outside. Uh, it is a bit, uh, it is a bit chaotic, and it is a bit hit and miss. Uh, but I think the main major sites, not only in Athens but elsewhere in Greece, are very, very accessible. Yes. Oh, that's good to hear. Okay. Uh, and then uh, Eleni is asking, what would Evan be able to say about all the beautiful neoclassical villas and buildings in Athens that were torn down in the first half of the 20th century? What do you think of the Antiparohi system, which was the system where they just almost bulldoze huge swaths of neoclassical architecture. Yeah, I mean, it is evident that uh, this system is, uh, let's say, directly responsible for the, for the look of Athens today. It's kind of very urban, gritty, concrete everywhere, high rises, mm. traffic, motorways, etc. I mean, all of it is a result of this kind of rapid urbanization that was achieved through the system of Antiparochy. Uh, whether it was necessary, I think, I would say it was unavoidable. Unavoidable. Greece came out of the Second World War and the subsequent war completely broke and broken uh, as, a, as a society. There was a, an urgent and pressing need for reconstruction and urbanization. And this was a solution. This was a solution to encourage developments uh, of new, more modern housing and encourage the urbanization of Athens as well, where all the, uh, the best jobs and the most opportunities were. So I would say it was it a... It did help the country grow in a rapid pace economically because... It did, yes. It went like 70% GDP higher. It was the second fastest growing nation in the world after Japan. Absolutely. For, for those high rises and all these kind of technical companies that, have, that emerged. Um, you know, as beneficiaries of this uh, Marshall plan, of course, they needed space uh, to come in and develop. And, you know, small homeowners, like a small kind of neoclassical house somewhere that could accommodate one family, you know what it is. I mean, the developer will tell you, you know, I'm going to build, you know, 20 flats here. Yeah. And you can keep two flats where previously you had one. And then I'm going to, you know, sell the them. And it was such a good deal for someone or someone who didn't have much at that uh, point in terms of kind of cash flow or property other than a house, this kind of old house under their name. So it was uh, almost a one-way street for most of them. Uh, the, one thing, the one thing that uh, I think, uh, I believe had a negative effect was uh, that uh, it all happened to kind of uh, fast and loose. Uh, in Greece, it was it like the, it was like the Wild West. Yes, you know where you know how did they used to say you know just go out there and put a flag and you know this uh, area you know all this area you rode on your horse for the past few hours is yours and you can create a 
the ranch there and it's going to be yours forever, right? Especially during the era of the military junta for yeah. a few years, they almost completely took away all regulation when it came to construction. Yeah. Uh, and that's where it went overdrive, hyperdrive. It, 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 yeah. it, it is how the West was won. And I guess this is how Athens was built, uh, modern Athens at least, in a very similar way. Uh, uh, th there is a lot of organic problems with this rapid urbanization. One of the most uh, common ones that anyone can experience if you're here in, uh, in the winter especially is that all these old rivers of Athens, mm -hmm. Ilissos, Kifisos, I mean they have become culverts now. They're covered under the tarmac sometimes and uh, when there is a major kind of uh, rain, you know, they overflow. It's just as crazy you know. that the ancient rivers are still flowing underneath yeah. us. Yeah. They just um, come out of the grates and uh, just hidden. Yeah, and they kind of have flood the uh, yeah. flood the streets and uh, and the pavements and uh, Athens is becoming a very difficult place, almost like a lake mm. in some areas close to the rivers. This here. <clears throat> so let me uh, pause you there. This is another reason why uh, Evan is the perfect IRL urbanist tour guide because you can ask him questions like these and he can give you a really really deep detailed answer about urbanism. <laughs> I have, uh, yeah, I have some answers <laughs> to some questions. I, I don't know everything. Of course. But everything I know, I'm very happy to share with you guys. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> uh, let me answer a few questions before we talk about this. Uh, Carol, thank you so much for my 50 stars. Ofofuto says, I'm close to 45 days here. Indeed, I am. Uh, Christina says, how long are you here for? You guys stay tuned. When I'm here, I'm here. When I'm not here, you'll know. I'm not here. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Lucky says only true urbanists can appreciate modernist architecture. The rest of us cry over lost decades of classical buildings. Indeed, yes, yes. Uh, Eleni, nice to see you here. And ooh, we have a $15 super chat. Orion, $20 super chat, says I wish I was there in beautiful Athens and watching from Queens, New York. Hey Orion, thank you so much for tuning in while you're watching from Queens. If you do uh, end up uh, wanting to come to Athens, can join Evan next year uh, we're gonna announce the tours soon and um, yes I do end up getting a cut so they end up uh, supporting urbanist endeavors and they end up supporting showing more of Greece and other countries soon where we are gonna do tours there as, a, as well you're gonna see all that on urbanists on videos shorts live videos vlogs and then you can go in real life with Evan like here where are we right now Excellent. But this is one of the oldest football stadiums in, uh, in Athens and perhaps mm. in Greece. This belongs to the so-called Panathinaikos Football Club, which is the, you know, the Panathinaikos means, you know, the team of all Athens, so to speak. Oh, okay. It's a very old football and sports club from uh, 1908, uh, I believe was established. Oh, plenty of time. Uh, this particular uh, stadium here uh, is one of the oldest in Athens and one of the oldest in Greece. It was established in 1923 so it's kind of going into a century old now mm. uh, and it was one of the first stadiums again in Greece that used concrete for its stands 10 years later yeah originally it was kind of wood uh, stands and then all these kind of concrete stands and concrete superstructures you see uh, they date from 19 1933 1934 so it's kind of uh, pretty old let's take a closer look that's really cool yeah. And green is the main color of, still to this day? Oh yeah, you can say <laughs> you can say what are the colors <laughs> of the team and uh, you know an interesting feature is Why like is there uh, a shamrock. If we can uh, yeah, if we go can go side. back again to this bit. You know, you can imagine uh, you can see the stands over there. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see this kind of enclosed area just under those stands over here. There mm. is a stadium somehow wedged in under this uh, stand uh, I think it stands number six and seven just at the back you know of, uh, of the stadium and it's so small and tiny and steep into the stairs mm. that the Indians call uh, the locals call it the Indian's tomb the Indian's tomb and what is the Indian's tomb the Indian's tomb is a Fritz Lang movie from 1959 okay and it has a scene where uh, you know a very kind of famous scene now where uh, uh, this, uh, this this actress, uh, I think her her, her name is uh, Deborah Paget. She does this kind of very kind of sultry Oriental dance with a uh, with a snake inside the tomb, oh, inside the Indian tomb. And to get down to this area where the snake is, the snake pit, so to speak, that she performs that dance, you go down to a very kind of steep set of steps to get to that place. 
Uh, so out of this uh, movie, the Fritz Lang movie in 1959, this part of the stadium, which was a new basketball stadium that was created around that time, some of the kids that went to the cinema to see the movie and was impressed by the you know, artistry of Fritz Lang's movie, they took the name and they kind of used it to describe these very steep steps that enabled them to access that small basketball stadium I, I think, under here. Oh, I so wish if, I could see it, that's so cool. So if you're local, this is, uh, you know, you don't call it the kind of the basketball stadium in Leoforos, you know, the this Indian is Avenue, you call it the Indian's tomb. How do they say in Greek? Otafos to Hindu. Oh, okay, okay. <clears throat> so this is uh, Alexandra's Avenue. It's another uh, big artery uh, here in Athens. Uh, and some, sometimes uh, this stadium, because it's the only stadium, obviously, and very important in Alexandra's Avenue, you, you just call it the Avenue yeah. in Leoforos. Oh, wow. uh, if you talk about the stadium, like the Avenue, this is it. There's only one stadium and only one Avenue that this might refer to. Why is there a shamrock on there? Sam That's Rock. rather Irish. Samrock is the symbol of uh, Panathinaikos, yes. It's, a, it's like a three-leafed uh, samrock oh. rather than four-leafed uh, clover. Or, oh, yeah. I see. Yeah. So it's slightly different from the Irish samrock. Yeah. <laughs> so the samrock, yes, this is the, uh, uh, it is the symbol of uh, Panathinaikos. <laughs> Ray, I'm not sure Ray's being sarcastic, but Ray says it looks so clean. I would say <laughs> if compared to some other nations, yes. If compared to other nations, no. <laughs> what do you think about this? So Susie actually asked, I wonder what public housing looks like in Greece. <laughs> and this is a, an opportune time to ask that question because this kind of looks like public housing, if I were to guess. Or it might be, uh, but the other guess of mine would be that this is a uh, squat takeover from leftists. So this here is a, is a very important uh, set of buildings, a very important neighborhood. We call it the refugee houses. Oh, I see, I see. They were built between 1933 and 1936 by the municipality of Athens. And it's perhaps the first example in Athens of public housing for that era. They were built, purpose built, to house the, the refugees from Asia Minor. If you, if you know, in 1922, the war between Greece and Turkey ended. Uh, the, the Greeks lost. In uh, 1923, you had the Treaty of Lausanne stipulating that the population, there would be a population exchange. Mm. So every Greek living in that area that was Turkey at the time, especially the Asia Minor, uh, were forced, forced, you know, forced to migrate back to Greece. And equally, there was a population exchange, uh, you know, going from, uh, you know, Turks and Ottomans from the Greek region, they could move back to, to Turkey. The Turks that moved to Greece, there were much fewer uh, than the ones uh, that moved from Asia Minor. There was a huge community. And uh, the population of Greece at that time increased by one third. That's a lot, man. That's a lot of people. Over one million, perhaps one million five hundred people moved to Greece from that population exchange. And all of a sudden, they turned up and they lived in uh, they lived in open fields, in campsites, like refugees, very much as they, as they live today. Uh, in, uh, in, in hovels and of course they had a huge need of, for support, financial support, they needed work and they needed a good place to live. Uh, so the municipality of Athens decided in 1933 after a lot of difficulty uh, because there was resistance but nothing like goes wanted to build a stadium there in the beginning. They All liked right, that, that spot better okay. than this one yeah. for some reason. Then there was a uh, there was even a prison a female prison here that uh, resisted to this project. They said, you know, don't bring the refugees here because uh, they're going to block the view we have from the prison cells. We don't want them. These refugees, just to clarify, were ethnically Greek. They were ethnic Greeks, but they're still, they were viewed with resentment. Oh, they were viewed with resentment still, so, okay. Nobody wanted them in the backyard, okay. which is uh, which is, it's a really sad story. Yeah. Uh, it's a really sad story. At any case, about 10 years later, the municipality of Athens built those, uh, you know, very modern and modernist, beautiful uh, for their time houses to house a number of families. I think there is about uh, maybe 200 flats or more. We can go and walk through it a little bit. Uh, it is very dilapidated, of course, because, because it has been all but abandoned after the 1960s, 1970s. And uh, as you 
I probably noticed, yes, it is now been squatted by drug users, the homeless. There is no one living there permanently, lawfully, mm -hmm. so to speak. Uh, well, it seems to have been taken over by communists. There are squads, yeah, anarchy oh. squads, Anarchist. communist squads, okay. uh, welcoming uh, immigrants there and refugees. It's some people of the night, there is like, you know, it's not like the kind of place you want to walk through after dark, so to speak. Yeah. But on the other hand, it's not, nothing ever happens there, uh, really. Uh, okay. It's uh, riddled by bullet holes, as you will see. This is from uh, December 1944, you know, the start of the Greek Civil War. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And there were battles between, uh, you know, the National Army and Communists at that time in the streets of Athens, street battles. Oh, really? Oh. Between the British and the National Army and the Communists that had established themselves in Athens. And, uh, of course, there were street and running battles and uh, some of the defenders were in that building, of course, because it, it's a very defensive po position with many different flats and buildings. And uh, you can see that they are riddled with bullet holes everywhere. Uh, because it was part, and this is one of the reasons that it became so dilapidated. I mean, it was uh, it used to be a war zone, basically, in 1940. And it Crazy. became increasingly dilapidated later. Um, if, I thought, uh, if Stathios says, I remember it being a prison back in the 70s, or the, I remember the prison back in the 70s. Perhaps. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if it has been converted in a prison, but mm -hmm. he's right to tell, because there was a female prison in this area in the 70s. I'm not sure if it's this building or another. Mm. Uh, so I'm gonna have to uh, come back to him on that matter, but yes. Wow, this is a lovely <laughs> stadium here. Yeah. All the wiring is exposed, concrete, raw concrete. <laughs> gnarly stadium with gnarly fans. Yeah, we did that too, okay. I don't know if we have any wow. Athenians now watching us. Uh, wow. Uh, yeah. Susie says, wow, interesting. Yeah, Susie, I'm glad you got your Any Panathinaikos fans? Uh, Do let us know. <laughs> what color not to wear here? What, what's the color not to wear? Red. Red, okay. Never. Oh, good, good. I'm not wearing red today. Red is the other guys. It's the other guys. <laughs> <laughs> red and yellow, yeah. Red or yellow? Uh, so gnarly. And then, uh, yes, it is cloudy. This is the first day, cloudy day I've seen in Athens. In the summer, there's almost no clouds. Yeah. <laughs> and Ray says, oh, uh, abandoned. Oh my God, that's too bad. Yeah, it is. Oh, let me show you more from this perspective. Yeah, it's rows, rows of houses. Wow. That's one. Uh, no, no, let's, uh, let's continue. Uh, yeah. I'll just show it from this perspective. So yeah, rows and rows of houses right down here. Housing. All right. So this is uh, police headquarters over there? <laughs> right next door. We got a building right, right next door and a kind of a, a small hospital next to it and the high rise, the modern high rise police headquarters. And this is the high courts. Oh, these are the high court. Yeah, the high court wow, of justice, let's say. It's so interesting with Athens because you see really poor, dilapidated buildings right next to very nice or nice buildings or official civic buildings. Yeah. Uh, which is very interesting because yeah. that this does not happen in every city. Yeah. It's rare that the civic center is right next to something like that. Yeah, you see kind of law and order, hospital, that. Anarchy. High Court of Justice, <laughs> you know, it's very well. And then, of course, you have Panathinaikos. It's a very interesting corner of Athens with a lot of history, and some of it is see a little bit more. difficult this history. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's go around it. Uh, but those uh, dilapidated buildings, you know, as much as uh, they don't seem, they don't seem much now, but they are protected because they are very important kind of modernist buildings with a very important mm. history that has to do with the exchange of populations uh, out of the Treaty of Lausanne. And, uh, uh, they will be modernized or preserved in the near future. Uh, they draw Polikatekia right there, apartment building. Yeah, so. there are some uh, various uh, kind of uh, fans have written. Yeah, it's all like open. Various team in support of their team <laughs> and uh, various kind of rude uh, comments for other teams, which I will not translate. <laughs> 
I'm uh, surprised there's a, them, this much graffiti uh, on a major stadium. Yeah, yeah. there is. A, they have given it up to the fans, more or less, yeah. to make it their own. Um, Interesting. There is a lot of uh, ultras, and uh, I'm not going to go as far and say hooliganism in Greece, but unfortunately, you know, kind of uh, football games in Greece, especially among big teams, can get very violent. Okay. Um, so if and that's rare because Greece is really not that violent of a society. Not violent as a society, yeah. yeah. You don't see kind of drunk and disorderly people on the streets quite yeah. often, which is surprising if you ask me with all the food and drink we're having. I don't know why, <laughs> but it's kind of frowned upon. But when it comes to football, everything changes, unfortunately, mm. sadly, I would say. And sometimes these matches, uh, you know, they're, they're really, uh, you know, you have kind of running battles among fans and uh, it's really you know, not as enjoyable as, uh, you know, if you want to watch a football game, perhaps, uh, you know, England is, uh, is your best bet. Uh, don't watch a football game in Greece. Don't, don't be that, uh, don't, don't do it. Wait, why is that? Like, uh, because I, I had a, a viewer of mine from Ikaria who actually recommended me to go to a football game in Greece. <laughs> well, what's your perspective on it as a tourist who's curious about the sport? Look, I mean, uh, yeah. if you don't mind constant kind of swearing, and shouting and kind of so throwing. it's not, not really kid friendly not family friendly no i mean you are you know every all the fans are inside in this stadium they are kind of inside the cage just like this <laughs> so they don't throw things at the players like bottles flares oh, wow. you know if you want to if you want to see this kind of thing like a you know a hundred flares all of a sudden kind of throw them into the stadium toilet papers lurals lighters bottles Potatoes with razor blades, you know, it's, you know, it's that, oh, this shit. is not football. So I'm not going to defend, uh, you know, the Greek football. Oh, wow. In this, I didn't uh, realize it was that bad. You know, it is, oh. it is rough. It is as, as yeah. gnarly as this stadium, exactly as you described it. Wow. Uh, uh, Susie says, could it be any worse than the Yankees game? <laughs> it sounds like it is. <laughs> You're making the a Yankees game sound extremely civilized. I don't know, guys. I mean, there's no. I mean, and you know, all of this happens right next to the police headquarters. Yeah, that's funny. But they don't. I mean, they're gonna send a token presence. I mean, nobody wants to put themselves, you know, their their kind of lives and their well-being on the line mm. amongst those madmen that gather in this stadium. In this stadium. And in Olympia, Kos, in Piraeus, and in Nike, in Neafila, all of the teams are the same. Mm. When they're in the stadium, they're behaving like, like crazy. So even uh, Emily says, uh, I wouldn't go watch a football game. It'll be rough. Yeah. Yeah, so interesting. Yeah, because, you know, uh, UK gets its reputation of being a bit rough, but not, not at this level that you're describing. England is, uh, these days, yeah. is a lovely place to go with your family enjoy a good football game with uh, with kids without kids with your friends yeah. with your kind of significant other it doesn't matter you know that you're not going to be you know assaulted on verbally you're not going to come in between any kind of uh, fi uh, fans fighting one another you know and and this was achieved in the 1980s because in england also there was a problem with hooliganism and this kind of uh, situation with football but they stopped it they stopped it and they, one of the ways they did was that every fan has to register now with the English Football Association so they know where you live. So if the camera catches you breaking things oh, wow. or you know, stabbing someone, yeah. they know where to come and get you. So before you go to the stadium, you're registered. Those people here, wow. nobody knows who they are. Nobody. You know, they're not, they're unregistered and that's one. And the second one is the price, the price of the ticket. Is it a bit more expensive? Yes, it is a bit more expensive to go into an English football game. Mm. But uh, that uh, ensures that there is enough security inside wardens, uh, cameras, you know, and a general kind of more upmarket situation that kind of uh, creates these good, uh, good field environments, you know, going and enjoying a game without any fear or threat for your life. And that reflects in the yeah. profits that they've been making. It's yeah. been going to the billions. Over these, here, uh, football you can come leagues. with, uh, you know, we can come and see a game with five and ten euros. That's it. Okay. And uh, no. not everybody has a ticket. You know, one of them is going to have a ticket and another ten are going to kind of tailgate them through the ten stats, you know. Mm. And in the end, <clears throat> this stadium, which is perhaps a 20 or 30,000 seater, it ends up you have like 50,000 drunken kind of madmen. Wow. 
in there. <laughs> well, we no, no, expected that. Well, that's, that, that's my boy. <laughs> it been... is interesting, and I've been, <laughs> yeah, I've, yeah. I've been in there, and uh, you know, I don't even support this thing. <laughs> but I have friends that. Well, you're not wearing red. <laughs> I have. I was not wearing red. I should have, but I, I wouldn't take my chances. And and but my mates support this team, and every yeah. time I come to Athens, they say, "Oh, Evan, Evan, come with us. We're going to the cinema." I said, okay, guys, what are we going to see? And they, they pop out the tickets for them <laughs> and they take me there. And they tell me every time, you know, if you don't, uh, if you don't cheer our team, we're going to tell everyone that you're, support, you're supporting the other. <laughs> uh, which way do you want to walk now? Let's uh, head over to a cafe. Uh, we can, yes, Fortune we can area. go somewhere. I mean, we can go around the stadium and yeah. end up at the corner of Alexandra's. Yes, why not? Or there's a nice quiet place over there. Just at the end of this. All right. Suburban. So and the reason Evan also knows a lot about England is because um, you covered England significantly. Uh, do you officially do tours? Have you done tours in England? I uh, I don't do multi um, multi day tours in in England, but I do uh, I do perform several tours in London. London. Okay. Um, architecture, history. Uh, some of it is uh, uh, mostly brutalism and post war modern, mm. uh, but also a number of wartime tours uh, mm. near Ryslip the northwest of London. Yeah. Yeah. And Ray says, I love hearing the insider view of these countries. What the US show is limited. What well, us, uh, what the US show is limited. What do you refer to, Ray? Oh, wow, why is there barbed wire? This, so I they mean, don't sneak into the stadium. I think it's to keep them in, yeah. rather than <laughs> rather than keep anyone else Yeesh. out. Holy <laughs> yeah. This the stadium looks more like from the movie Mad Max. Yes, it is. Yes, <laughs> then, yeah. because you know I, I'm in a partnership with New York City Football Club. Uh, awesome partners. You've seen my videos on on football, and <laughs> there's a lot of families, little kids laughing, having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of women uh, as well. It's a, it's a very nice, friendly atmosphere. Uh, are we crossing? No. Okay. Yeah, we can cross. We could uh, we could sit here. It's as quiet as anywhere. Or uh, we can keep on walking if Let's you like. Let's walk a little bit more. Let's yeah. walk a little bit more. Where else can, oh, oh, this is cool. Tiny church. Let's go. What? Let's go? Oh, yeah. yeah. Emily says, very interesting tour. Evan is very knowledgeable. <laughs> Tons of interesting facts I didn't know. Yeah. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> <clears throat> and you see, you know, it's such a lovely city. Just out of all this kind of madness, the traffic. You know, the stadium, the noise. And you can find these little quiet corners. You know, it's like a... That's right. Yeah, I love how beautifully decorated they are, these... Um, Peaceful. Little Byzantine churches. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like many churches in Athens, in Greece, especially in Athens, it was probably being built on the site of a former pagan table, temple. Yeah. And, the, and then using pieces of it. Yeah. yeah. So here we also see probably something that might even predate the church, if I can and read it. 95, here's Byzantinos, now it's a year Byzantine. Byzantine. Uh, Byzantine kind of church of the 11th century. Uh, <clears throat> and then while well, we can potentially a, even see the foundations of that set. There is a crypt for sure down there. Yeah. Uh, oh, let me see if I can go in. <laughs> that would be so cool. I would love to go in. Let's oh, see if I can. Hard. Yeah, let's see if we can light it up. Christoph says in Germany soccer stadiums can depend on the club in terms yeah. of madness. Yeah. Yeah, we can't see too much, but you guys get the idea. There's a crypt. There's a crypt down there. 
That's cool. Γεια σα. Τίποτα, σας. απλά είχαμε την περιέργεια να μάθουμε, είναι κρύπτη αυτό. Όχι, oh, δεν ξέρω, αλλά είναι από την αιχαιολογία όλα αυτά. Οκ, okay. <laughs> εντάξει. Περίεργη απλά. Αλλά αυτά έχει ένα λαγούμε από την μεριά του, ενώ ότι ήταν λήψη ένα μοναχό. Α, οκ. Είναι και εσύ μαζί τα βράδια. Α, είναι μπροστά. Οκ. Yes, it is, uh, it is a crypt. It's a crypto that's yeah. <clears throat> that used to keep uh, uh, the remains of uh, monks and, and priests. And... I like how these churches usually employ um, older women to keep keep care of them and yeah. landscaping. Yeah, it's very common. Yeah. Oh, right here is it. Madista, ne? Ah, okay. Έχει σκαλοπάτια ή απλά έχει αυτό. Ah, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, it is a crypt and uh, they need to get some sort of permission from the Metropolitan to open it to the public. Oh, of course, yeah, that makes sense. Which might never happen. Yeah. Do you want to look at the mic? Yes, thank you. Take it. Oh, okay. Δεν το έκανα καλά, δεν τον έχω μάθει τίποτα. Σα ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ. Καλημέρα. That's cool. Yeah. So, yeah, let's send these chairs and then we'll finish here. Yeah. We have a Greek delight. Don't. This is not at all associated with the T word. 100% Greek. Greek no, delight. no, no, this is the Greek <laughs> delight. Don't say it too loud. <laughs> yeah. Let's all sit down over here. Yeah. I don't know. Is this uh, the local yeah. church? Okay, yeah, we can sit. Yeah, I think it is. Okay. No, it is. No, I prefer over here somewhere. We'll order a coffee or a drink. No. For the special schedule. Καθόμαστε στο τραπεζάκι εδώ έξω στην εκκλησία. Είναι πολύ καλό. Είναι πολύ καλό. Ένα φρέντο εσπρέσο και ένα φρέντο καπουτσίνο. Ένα φρέντο καπουτσίνο. Ευχαριστούμε πολύ. Φεράκια και αν μπορείτε, ευχαριστούμε. Είναι λίγο πιο όρεγγι, αλλά απλώ πολύ λίγο. Δεν είναι πολύ καλό. is arriving imminently oh nice wow that was a really good um greek delight yeah yeah <laughs> really really good <laughs> superior to any other delights around yeah. the world oh yes of course yeah, yeah. Of, superior uh, to any delights that may exist yeah or dubious. may not exist in other nearby countries we have many many dubious uh, provenances but i'm sure <laughs> since greeks invented everything <laughs> i'm sure we invented also the the delights <laughs> that some people wrongly refer to as other things other than Greek delight, but anyway. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so this is our last stop. We're going to share a coffee. We're going to discuss uh, about the tours um, because we're going to launch Urbanus X Explorabilia tours. <laughs> Quite a mouthful, but stay tuned. 2024, uh, you will be able to go on experiences like I showed you on live video. Like I've gone with Evan already four times uh, today um, in real life with Evan, hosted by him, who's a longtime urbanist, who's an expert in travel and exploring these places and going off the beaten path. Uh, he really knows all the secrets and is really well equipped to tell you about the architecture, about the urbanism, about the legends and myths. I really love it. Uh, so someone gave a, uh, Orion says, great, Greek patriotic shirts. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, I got it. I got it blue because of Greece. Uh, luckily, I, it seems like I could wear it in that stadium. You can, yes. Otherwise, can. would they confuse me as an Ikaria football club? No, you can get away with blue. Surprisingly, there are not not many of the notable teams have blue as their colors for oh, some okay. reason. It's more reserved for the national team, which we all right. love equally. Yeah. Thank you so much for the super chat. I do appreciate it. All right, let, let's uh, get a little bit of perspective. Evan, what, what even got you into tours in the first place? 
Wow, <laughs> that's a great question. I mean, I've always been involved in travel. Yeah. I, I studied travel and business administration. I did marketing uh, with the travel kind of direction. And uh, not least, I, I worked uh, for a travel oh, company better. for a good 15 years. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> so naturally, my entire kind of life, you know, has been, uh, I've been involved professionally um, in, in travel. But even before that, I just loved it. You know, when my parents put me in a, in a car and they would just go to places and stop over uh, somewhere and enjoy a meal or a drink and see kind of a new place every time that I'd never been to. Mm. Uh, and I enjoyed that uh, very much as a kid. So in a way, emotionally and professionally, I've always been involved in, in the process of going to places. And of course, enjoying like uh, the trip more than, you know, enjoying the destination sometimes. Yamas. Well, how, what is the, the tradition with yamas in, in Greece? Yamas. Do be, but isn't it associated with bad luck to, to cheers to, to coffee? Who says that's that? What, that's why I, I, I've I tried a few times to cheers to coffee with Greeks and they wouldn't do it. it well, okay. Let's you say can cheers. Do, Let's say you cheers. can do it with coffee. Cheers. cheers yamas. <laughs> <laughs> You usually do it with alcohol, but nobody says it's, uh, you know, it's not usual okay, okay. to cheer someone with coffee. But I don't think it's, you can do it with water as well. Okay, okay. Because you're wishing on someone's health. Oh, that's good. Yeah. And if it works with alcohol, I'm pretty sure it works with everything else too. <laughs> I mean, it's the first time I think, you know, this superstition. Yeah. Is that what they taught you in a career in Crete? I mean, there's, no, there's no, I learned about this here in Athens. In Athens. <laughs> <Okay>. Athens <yeah. laughs> uh, I didn't try it in Crete or Crete, but uh, yeah. I learned about it in Athens. Um, so, yeah, tell us a little, uh, as you were saying, uh, you were running tours. You, one of the first tours you actually ho uh, hosted was uh, on camera in London in, uh, in the Barbican here on Urbanist. Mm -mm. I remember that time. Mm -mm. And... Uh, of course, I mean, I have, uh, I, you know, I don't know how evident it is, but I have a huge kind of camera scare. I, I just cannot get myself to, to do this that we do now. Yeah. Or at least I couldn't. Before you pushed me into the deep end that morning, where we said, uh, you know, we, I think we got in touch. And I said, oh, you know, I love your videos. I'm an urbanist fan. I feel that I've been in New York, everywhere in New York, although I've never set my foot there. And since you're coming to London, why don't we grab a coffee? <laughs> you just came in just like you did now, although you had, uh, of course, let me know beforehand, but you kind of whipped out the camera and you just went live and I was like, <laughs> what am I going to do now? Well, you did show me, you did say you were going to show me the barbican. <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe I wasn't clear <laughs> that you were showing me the barbican in front of thousands of people. <laughs> there was like, there were like, yeah, thousands yeah, of people. Yeah, at the beginning, like maybe 10,000. 12,000 views or something like that. So, yeah, but yeah. that was like, you know, this is like a humongous uh, audience. I mean, it's like, it's just mind blowing how, um, you know, you you kind of shown me in a way how to do this and what is possible. So that very much kind of kickstarted me into thinking that, oh, you know, maybe I can, maybe I like this very much and I would like to go more walking tours and kind of go around London and show my London and some interesting aspects of it. Um, as well as here in Greece and other cities in the world. And it's mostly stories that have had an emotional impact on me, mm. uh, which I weave also through uh, social history and uh, sometimes World War history and, and the history of architecture into more coherent narratives. But in the end, it's, it's always, there's always something about me in there, like a personal experience or an emotion or a situation that mm. I experienced. It's not just about throwing a, you know, a history book of parts yeah, uh, exactly. at people. That's, that's easy. That's, everyone can do it. Um, that's why I tend to lead tours and create tours in places that I know very well, intimately. Um, so I can relate many of those personal stories as part of the historic and other narratives. Exactly. You're not afraid of the darker aspects as well of uh, these cities. You don't dwell on them, which is good, but I mean, um, sometimes certain tours would not acknowledge a stadium like this in the middle of the city. Uh, but I, I'm glad you acknowledge more the grungier um, underbelly of cities and yeah. areas as well. Yeah. I think, uh, I think it, it, those stories demand to be told. I think they are part of the fabric of the city as much as any other story. 
Yeah. So we have visitors coming here in Greece, admiring the Parthenon, the Golden Age, you know, the kind of Byzantine churches and all that. And this is part of the fabric of, of the city and society. But this is also a part. And I always held the view that uh, we should show the pleasant aspects, but also sometimes the, most, the more difficult aspects mm. of a destination. So we can have a more balanced overview of how life is really there. Um, yeah, because if you see a part like this here in Athens, yeah. you start appreciating and you start seeing the contrast uh, and you start appreciating other places and, and the comparison. Yeah, of course. And it is, you know, it's a, it keeps context and a nice texture to any narrative. Precisely. You see the you full know. picture. It's a real city, not just a uh, yeah. tourist spot that people just go to. Yeah, those tourist spots tend to be very manicured and even the stories sometimes uh, that are officially related yeah, are, are manicured. I mean, one can talk about the golden age of Athens, but also point out why Athens, the Athenian democracy was not, you know, so kind of perfect as we might imagine it now. And it was totally unrelated to the type of democracy we have now. Mm -hmm. I mean, only the very wealthy people could vote and there were slaves mm. in ancient Athens that couldn't vote and they didn't have any rights, for example, and, you know, and kind of a tyranny and totalitarianism could be legislated. People could vote in times of danger for someone to become a dictator and kind of hold all power for as long as it took for the danger to, to go away. And you would hope mm. that this person would be a good, sensible leader and wouldn't be kind of selfish. You know, and he would give up yeah. this power back to the uh, back to the ecclesia, back to the kind of state, to the electorate. Um, so there's many elements you can you can show within the context of a very powerful and popular story. You can also show the other aspects for texture. Yeah, for example, you cover the Greek Civil War when you do the Peloponnese tours. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Which is something that... Uh, Almost no one covers uh, in, in real life experiences. No one wants, yeah, no one wants to talk about it. Or at least no one wants to talk about it, not, um, not only among us, but also, uh, of course, when you have guests. You don't want to tell them that we were kind of <laughs> yeah. slaughtering each other not so long ago. <clears throat> and still, in a heated political conversation, sometimes in Parliament, you know, there are those kind of civil war overtones in those discussions and conversations. And I think... If we hear it and feel it on our day to day, this kind of, this undertow of that uh, very painful events that marked, uh, you know, Greece years ago, I think it's a story that deserves to be told. Mm -hmm. We deserve to publicize it, get perspectives from our guests, from other visitors, from other countries. A painful story that if we relate it, we can absorb it and deal with it better emotionally. Right. As, uh, as Greeks and you know, as, as, as everyday, everyday people. Everybody has a, a civil war story. Yeah, I mean, and that's the same thing I tried to get here in, um, that's the same thing I tried to get here in Urbanist, is tried to get like a well-rounded uh, view of a city and not just focus on the glitzy spots, nor just focus on the darker spots because that could get rather depressing very quickly. Uh, but see a show, as you mentioned, a well-textured, layered version. So it's cool that on the tour, um, it's not just going to be Greek Civil War spots, but also you'll be doing also food and, and uh, interesting archaeological sites and things like that, right, as well? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, imagine it as a, as a beautiful Greek mosaic, you know, of, of old. And you have, you know, the whole picture, but you need kind of stones of various kind of colors, shapes and sizes mm. to create this beautiful kind of picture that if you see it from a distance, you understand what it is. You cannot use just one color or just one shape because it's not going to look, um, you know, it's not, you're, you're not going to get the whole picture. So this is what uh, I, I imagine our tour will be. Just a beautiful mosaic of every aspect of Greece. It's going to have great histories. It's going to have great food. It's going to have kind of meetings with locals. Uh, we're going to, you know, dine with local families, see other parts of Greece as well, perhaps a bit more rural, see other cities and towns, not least kind of spend quite quite a bit of time in Athens, mm. um, you know, seeing the, the main sites, you know, the Acropolis, etc. Um, it's it's 
going to have everything. Um, we, we're not fully planned yet, but give everyone just a taste of what the Greek tour will be in 2024. Yes. Yeah, so what, what's going to happen? So what's going to happen, I guess, <clears throat> I can imagine uh, that we're going to be meeting in Athens, staying in a very nice hotel uh, close to the, to the city center, Syndagma Square, Omonia, in Plaka, depending. Uh, at the time of this, you know, on the time of the season, etc., uh, we're going to spend at least uh, two mornings in Athens, full mornings, visiting the main sites, not least uh, spending quality time at the Acropolis, the Acropolis Museum, and walking around uh, the streets of Athens. We're going to be seeing a lot of the nightlife, enjoying the cuisine, you know, a first taste uh, for many of, uh, of the guests, I suppose, uh, and then we're going to. We're getting on the bus, on the coach, and exploring the rest of uh, the rest of Greece. We can, we could go north towards Delphi and Meteora, mm -hmm. uh, the fabulous monasteries on the cliffs, and of course Delphi, the navel of Earth, uh, the very holy uh, ancient Greek religious site. Uh, or we can go south towards the Peloponnese, and kind of one of the kind of rugged ag agricultural places of Greece. Um, see a little bit of the smaller towns of places like Mistras and ancient Sparta. Uh, you know, all the way to the beautiful kind of uh, rocks of the southern Peloponnese. Oh, Monembasia, Githio, uh, the Diros Caves that we visited together not too long ago. Um, so there's plenty of avenues, uh, you know, we, we, I, I think... <laughs> yeah, it won't be just one Greek tour, but we'll start with one specific one. Yeah, I think uh, stay tuned, you'll find out yeah. where in Greece it'll be. Yeah, uh, we have to decide. There's yeah. so many fabulous locations we yeah. want to show you that we have at some point to say, okay, this is how many days it's gonna be, and this is, you know, how much we can stack in this tour. <laughs> uh, so it can be fun and informative. I'll put up to a vote. What do you think, ladies and gentlemen? Let us know uh, if anyone is already interested in the tour. Let us know, do you rather go north or south? Uh, you, um, you already saw the southern portion. You saw the northern portion on my videos from 2021. Uh, so you could be the judge as well. Um, now, what, in terms of pricing, pricing is not finalized, but what does the pricing include? <laughs> the pricing, the way I imagined it, is going to include um, all the stays in the hotel uh, with a wonderful breakfast in each. Uh, it's probably going to be in the three, four star category, uh, maybe five in some cases, depending on seasonality. The price will include breakfast every day, it's going to include transport, uh, in, uh, with a professional driver, uh, in fully insured uh, new coaches, mini coaches, 17 seaters. The groups are going to be small, up to 10, maybe 12 guests maximum. So we can have time to, you know, know one another and exchange and spend time together. Uh, it's going to include all entrance tickets uh, to everywhere we're going to go, or public transport wherever we may take it. It's going to include. Uh, any guests, guides, experts we might invite in the tour mm -hmm. uh, to give you even more context and texture and kind of deeper histories and stories on particular sites. Uh, That's amazing. And then uh, the only thing the really person has to spend is uh, their own flights to get to Athens. The, yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. It, okay. it will not include flights. It will not include flights. We will, we will meet in Athens and, and we'll go. Okay. Um, you know, it could uh, well include uh, airport transfers too. Uh, so you don't have to look for a taxi or public transport as soon as you arrive. A driver is going to be waiting for you at the airport and it's going to take you to the hotel and we're going to meet there and we're going to start. And then, um, of course, these details are not finalized, but um, rooms sometimes are shared on tours. Um, and sometimes there's a, a supplement if you want your own room. Sure. So do you usually work that way? How do you usually work in your own tours prior? Yeah, yeah. We, usually it works that way that, uh, you know, the price we will give is going to be a per person sharing a double or twin room. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, if we have two guests traveling as a couple, this is their price per person to join the tour. If someone wants or needs a single room, there's going to be a supplement uh you know for a single room okay yeah okay cool yeah. that's awesome and almo says i vote for an introduction for uzo so yes that's where <laughs> that's where you start getting to the urbanist element sure of evan's tours evan and i already share a lot of stuff in common but uh what we aim to provide you 
on the tour hosted by Evan is um, those smaller experiences that usually are not on the tours. Uh, so most tours might give you a wine tasting, but no, we, I think we aim to provide something with Uzo, uh, definitely something or with Sipuro or Rocky, uh, and definitely something with coffee as well. I think we'll try to aim to show you something uniquely about coffee in each of the locations that we uh, go to as well and uh, uh, have the tours for. Um, so stay tuned for that. And then if, if we do other countries that are more beer oriented, something with beer, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then also more urbanism and architecture um, things sprinkled in the tour as well. Uh, so let us know if you have any final questions. Uh, Evan, um, how, so once we get the tour details finalized, how would people sign up? We don't have a, a site yet, but how would people sign up? It's, it's emailing you or how would it work? There's going to be a dedicated page mm -hmm. on the tour, uh, which could be the way I'm thinking about it. This page could uh, reside on your website and also on my website, so they can book either way. And there's going to be an email, dedicated email contact uh, just for this tour, where you can contact Ariel or me in order to book uh, your space in the tour. Okay, wonderful. This is great. I'm super excited. Uh, I'm so glad to be partnering up with Evan. Stay tuned for Urbanist X Explorabilia Tours coming out in 2024. Details will be announced closer to the holiday season, so you can book early uh, if you want to go on an Urbanist experience in real life hosted by Evan. And you'll be seeing videos of these places before you even go. So uh, unlike some tours where you don't know where you're in for, in our case, you will know what you're in for. Uh, in this case, you'll know uh, the places a little bit more intimately. And that's, I, I think that's a cool experience that um, other, other tour groups might not offer. So everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. Evan, I appreciate you tuning in thank uh, you. and coming over. Uh, where can people find your work? www.explorapilia.co.uk Awesome. Check them out uh, and stay tuned. Holiday season will be announcing the tour soon. Everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. Keep being awesome and always... Always stay curious, my friends. <laughs> Keep on exploring and always stay curious. <laughs> Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah. And I always say a wave goodbye a little bit this way. Yasas. Yasas.